Barber College Success is brought to you by Craig Charles of Crown Cuts Academy JC, Crown Cuts Academy Bristol, and now Professional Nail Academy Downtown Johnson City. Mm, also, we just added up a esthetician program in Johnson City, so that's big for us. Moving up. Um, today we got a special episode. My guy, he's on the episode before, but he wants to come again, come back again, and we're gonna talk about the full eclipse. We're gonna tell his whole story from the beginning and how it evolves in him becoming the barber. <clears throat> I think his story is gonna inspire so many people. I think it's gonna help push the narrative and let you know that never give up. Um, no matter what you're going through, there are people out there who's willing to help you and there are resources out there for you because everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has something that they can say that's an obstacle that they've overcome or been in, has been in their way. So today we're gonna to jump into a series that we had before, Student Stories. And we're gonna let my guests introduce themselves before we jump into that, and we're gonna hit it. Uh, Jordan Barr, representing Bristol, Tennessee, Studio 423. Jay Bob on Instagram, hope everybody's doing a good day today. Having a good day, I said doing a good day. Man, I'm like, just <laughs> lack it. Uh, uh, Shane Tolls. Uh, just, just here to do it. You got an Instagram shape? Yeah, it's uh, so Barber 13 uh, I think that's all I got, really. I'm <laughs> on, I know I'm on TikTok and yeah. Facebook. Oh, but. definitely. That's what's up. And again, shout out to Feed Spot for ranking as the top, top podcast in the country, top 25 podcast in the world. Uh, we are continuously going to give fresh content. We just love what we do. We have some new and fresh and exciting things coming up for you. We have a website up now. You can check us out on the website uh, where we have all our episodes on our website. Um, if you have a problem finding it, it's barbacollegesuccesspodcast.com. Um, check it out. Um, but today we're going to jump into it. And we're going to talk about our series, Student Stories. So, um, <clears throat> Shane, you know, you're a student at my school, but also you're becoming like one of my good friends. It's, a, it's nice to have you in my life, I'll tell you that. You know what I mean? And it's important to have, like me and you, Jordan, we're good friends. And I tell people about our friendship, they're like, man, how, how you know, I'm like, I've known Jordan forever. And <laughs> you just have that. It's because, I guess, because like the, the age difference, I guess, maybe. Right. I don't know. But I, I feel like when you after a while you kind of surround your, yourself with good people that are kind of like like-minded and right you know just want to do good stuff man that's where that's where good friends come from right and people always ask them well, how did jordan you I'm like me i mean i remember when jordan was in high school middle school coming up coming to get a heck and i was his barber getting it. and now then he became a student at my school and now he is doing his own thing where he's going to be someone else's ripple so enough of that let's jump into the so, so shane what made you want to tell your whole story from the beginning <clears throat> yeah, uh, I've had a couple of, of times where I've went out of town to uh, to meetings, and I was able to be in, introduced as a guest speaker. And so, when you say meetings, what meetings are you talking about? I mean, I go to DAA, AA, and I went to a convention in Mountain City. So, when you say DAA, AA, some people will know that, some people might mm -hmm. not. Know Alcoholics that. Anonymous is AA, and then you got Drugs Alcohol Anonymous. Okay, DAA which you can talk about drugs and alcohol. It's not just one thing, because some place or up, <clears throat> AA doesn't really like you talking about uh, drug use. Mm -hmm. You're strictly there to talk about alcohol. Okay. You know, then you have NA, Narcotics Anonymous. Okay. <clears throat> so, so start from the beginning. Where do you want to take this story from? Where do you want to start? You know, I actually talked to my mom the other day, uh, uh, yesterday, and I was playing uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. I just got this idea in my head and I was like, I need to call my mom mm -hmm. and get some backstory because I really don't remember a lot from whenever I was a child. Mm -hmm. So I asked her a few questions and, you know, like, uh, when was drugs and alcohol introduced into my life? And she told me, she says that, that you were born into it. Mm -hmm. You know, your grandpa was, your grandpa was an alcoholic and all the Tolst family was alcoholics. Right. You know, and then on top of that, she met my father when uh, I was born, six months, something like that. And he was <laughs> alcoholic, 
and uh, cocaine user, you know. So bear with us. We're going to tie all this in and turn it into how you became a barber. It's going to come towards the end. Mm. And I know people think we're just coming to talk about all this extra stuff, but I think it's important for people to see that you can get a career and you can start something and fall in love with something, make it your passion, mm. no matter what obstacle you came through or what you overcome. Yeah. yeah. And it just happened to be that you become the barber, but go ahead, it's your, it's your show. Yeah, uh, so growing up, I was, uh, you know, pretty wild. Uh, family didn't really know how to handle me. I didn't really know how to, I didn't really know why I did a lot of things that I did, you know, then I got diagnosed with some of these symptoms like uh, ADHD and stuff. And then I got older and it kind of got worse. Anger got worse and things like that. But throughout that time, I was always running around in the swamps mm -hmm. and in the woods with a bunch of drunks, you know, and then <laughs> they go off somewhere. And then, of course, you're a kid, you're going to follow through. And, mm -hmm. You know, you see them doing stuff, but you don't know what's good. I was always told it was like uh, Indian tobacco you know, whenever they smoked weed, you know? So growing up, growing up, I always knew when to stay away from the parents, but I would always go out and do my own thing. Then I started meeting friends in uh, this little town that I grew up in, Mount City. And as I got a little bit older, they started splitting it out and getting in trouble with drugs and alcohol. I even had a couple of my friends one time steal my dad's beer. I have his cooler at the back of his work truck. And then my dad went and chased him down. Hmm. But I was never a part of that. I stayed away from all the, the drugs and stopped becoming friends with some of the guys that were doing the drugs because that's, even though my father did it, I knew to stay away from it. For some reason, I just wasn't into it. And, uh, you know, I, I had a son um, whenever I was uh, 16. I dropped out of school my freshman year, quit football. And uh, that's, that's whenever I got introduced to uh, Xanaxes and things of that nature. And uh, that kind of went really downhill mm. for me. Um, you know, uh, it was with some of the time uh, from the age of 11 to 13, and I was in foster care, you know? And then from that point, I found out that my real father wasn't my real father. Mm. So I found I had to meet my biological father because of court. Mandated. So whenever I met this guy, he took me from my family for a little bit, and we didn't get along at all. They had, they had everything that I ever wanted in my life. The running wild, the bass fishing, the, the goat cart, the, the guns, the fast cars, the living in the Everglades, <laughs> you know? Mm. And, uh, but we just didn't get along. I had two other brothers and another sister I didn't know about either. And uh, so whenever I had this kid, I was like, all right, and you're, you're 16 years old, have yeah. your son. I mean, that's frightening for anyone. Yeah. That is crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I knew that in my life I was going to be there for him. Things didn't really turn out that way. Um, you know, it wasn't really on her end. It was more of the parents' decision. And we went to court. And I thought I was signing a piece of paper stating I was going to get rights to be able to see my kid. Mm -hmm. And I ended up signing my rights away because I wasn't present with a lawyer or an adult. So it seemed like at a young age, from birth, he was almost behind the eight ball. Yeah, yeah, but I handled it in ways differently. Like I destroyed things. I, I was very bad. I was, I was very, I'd fight. There's all, I did all kinds of other things except for drugs and alcohol, you know? And then um, I remember I have a picture of me and my son. I think he's like two years old. And he's sitting in a chair and I got a towel around his neck and I'm cutting his hair on the porch. Mm. You know, I used to cut, I used to cut all the guy's hair on the hill. And so this was like about 15, 16 years old? I was 17. <clears throat> and you I'm started? About, yeah, about 18 years old. And yeah. So your and first haircut was your son? First haircut was my son. You know, other than my own, because I always stayed bald. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But um, my son was the first and friends and all that. And then it came to a point where uh got in a lot of trouble. Uh, you know, sometimes it always starts like that, Jordan. Somebody know you're doing a haircut. You might just do some do your dad or do your brother or someone and then everyone be like, Yo, can you cut me? Even though you have no experience mm -hmm. of cutting. Did that ever happen to you? 
because uh, <clears throat> I, I my first haircut was on my little brother, and uh, I mean I posted on Snap. You know, I had a couple of people say it's like, yo, you, you know, you trying to you trying to you know let me get a haircut, and I'm like, but myself and I was like, nah, I can't. You know, I just not comfortable. Right. You know, but yeah, it's, so, I mean, so, all it takes so, is one person to start something. So I could see where. What led you to cut your son's hair that day? He needed a haircut. <clears throat> and I don't know. I just, I was like, I can cut his hair. Right. I'm spending time with him. You know, I can cut his hair. Right. And now li life is happening. Life is happening. Life is coming full circle at you. And. Yeah. I, uh, I kind of got resentful for not being able to see my kid, not towards the people, but to, to, to myself. And I started hanging out with people that I knew that dropped out of school and adults uh, that they were hanging out with. Mm -hmm. And that's whenever I really got on the pills. I got on the Xanaxes and that's whenever I committed my first strong arm robbery on a guy. And uh, so what was, that, where, was your, where was your parents at at this time, your dad? Or you were just trying to rebel from they your were dad? On, they were on the hill. <clears throat> they lived on uh, East Mountain City mm -hmm. and I was in town. And this is with your, your biological dad or your stepdad? It was my stepfather, okay. which is, in my opinion, just my biological father after all the shit that I've been through. Mm -hmm. Tommy, so. But um, on top on top of that, uh, my dad knew what I did. You know, it's a small town. Mm -hmm. And this guy wasn't from our town. But he came in showboating and uh, acting like he was better. So, uh I kind of made him feel like he wasn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, that night I got arrested. That was the first time I ever was uh, incarcerated. Uh, I got caught stealing a stolen truck. Uh, and I took it off to a cow pasture. I got stuck a little S10. Mm -hmm. And I passed out from head to toe in mud in the truck. So I went to jail. And then, uh, you know, I ended up seeing that guy in jail that night as well. And he was like, that's, that's the dude. That's the guy that did that. And uh, I was like, I really don't remember him at first, but he came to me later, you know? So, so was that where things started spiraling downhill or was yeah. it like a specific Absol no, time? Ab absolutely. <laughs> like it didn't take no more than six months when I caught 13 felonies. Mm. Uh, after getting that feeling of physically taking something from somebody, that's whenever I got the adrenaline. I became an adrenaline junkie. And I started robbing jewelry stores, Exxons, and so you, anything that spiked any kind of- Adrenaline. Yeah. So at this point now, all these things are happening to you in your life and, <clears throat> and you're about what, 17, 18? I was 18. And at what point, that critical point in your life, I know you, we spoke about it and extended a little bit. That was one of the biggest triggers when your dad. Yeah, after after being arrested for all the the um, burglaries, you know, my dad was expecting me, expecting never to see me again in person, mm -hmm. and he told me that over the over a video chat that's on a little TV screen, and I I didn't really see my dad cry too much except for whenever he thought his mother passed. And my dad crying on her in that phone tore me up. Mm. And I made him a promise that I would never steal, take anything from anybody ever again. And uh, I did that. And then I did, I got out on, on probation. And I did, I tried my best to do that probation, man. But I couldn't do it in Mount City. Mm. Like I couldn't do it. I, I went and lived with my father. And we had a great time, a lot of drinking. Right. A lot of working out, a lot of crying, and just trying to make it. And uh, so jumping to, um, I went on the run mm -hmm. for about six months. I went to, Mount, uh, went to uh, Florida. So again, uh, this podcast is just, again, hearing Shane's stories and seeing how you can bounce back. Again, things happen in your life, but a lot of people get down and out and, and feel that they're in this by themselves. And there's nowhere to turn. And... We're just going to talk about, like, again, Shane's story and then come into it and see the resources that are out there for you to help you no get back God. on track. And the people and ways to kind of 
or, or triggers that, that might be in your life that you can avoid or things that can help you get back on track. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many resources out there. A lot of times people don't know. And we're going to talk about those resources towards the end of the, the podcast. But go ahead, Shane. So uh, close to that, with right. me and my dad hanging out so much, you know, getting drunk, he would start telling me things, you know. And then my mom also, uh, here in later life, you know, she told me some stuff also. Right. But he would say, you know, there's some of the stuff that's, that goes on with you do has to do with us when you was a child. You know, with just uh, not knowing where to be, the misplacement and the anger and stuff. You know, like I found when I found out that uh, when I was five years old, me and my little sister were taken from my parents because of a coke deal uh, to an undercover officer, mm -hmm. and we had been living in a crack house for a while, and then we got taken to my my grandmother, and then we lived in a Salvation Army for. I think about seven or eight months before they would let my mother leave. And she didn't know that my father was a cook back there. <laughs> and I had seen him and just fucking took off. Mm. And they were going to kick us out because we couldn't be around each other. So your you know? stepdad was, that was like your hero. That was like your everything. That was your ride. Uh... Roy, Roy Stewart was my best friend, mm. you know. And, uh, so, so if he tell you run through a brick wall, wall, you run through the brick wall. He was down for him. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was able, I roofed with him since the day I could walk. Mm. You know, that's all we did. He was he was a master roofer, and unfortunately, him falling off of a roof and breaking his back and being hurt so bad is ultimately what got him addicted to the pain pills. Other than the fact that he was already an addict anyway, you know. But he had too many. He had way too much, bro. He had a trigger. Yeah. That, that grabbed yeah. him. He quit the alcohol. I remember the last night me and my dad had together was <clears throat> I got out of jail. He got off the bus. And he was fucked up. God, he was messed up, dude. And we got him his favorite meal was a chocolate shake and a double quarter, a double quarter pounder with cheese. That was his favorite meal. And we went to the house, and he gave me a beer, the last beer. And he poured himself some sweet tea. We walked out back, and he told me that we were going to build this shed for my mom to drive into so she didn't have to come into the cold. I was like, okay. You know, I didn't want to do it. I did not want to do it. My dad made me work like a motherfucker. I did not want to work for this dude at all. I was dreading it. And he didn't wake up the next morning until late. I was like, oh, fuck yeah. We're not going to do this, you know? And then uh, he didn't wake it up at all. Mm -hmm. And that's whenever he had like these little pieces of candy, the peanut brittle. You know, white white was old school candy, and I seen some uh, seen some white down here on the side of his mouth, and I was like, oh maybe, you know, fell asleep with one of his mouth, but instead that was from when it re convulsed. And, mm -hmm. um, then we heard the the rattle, and then that's whenever I started giving him CPR uh, in front of my mom, my two little sisters, all screaming and crying at me and do this shit. And uh, his last his whenever I. Gave him my my air. Whenever it came back, his liver went in my mouth. I mm. almost threw up. And then, but I was like, it's my dad. So I went back in there, and I kept, and I'll just hear my air come back out. And it kept, and it messed with me hard. Whenever it was all said and done, it was hard. I didn't talk for days. So you're hearing this, Jordan. What's going through your mind? What are you thinking about? Uh, it's definitely a tough, I mean, I could imagine uh, having to go through that. That's crazy. Uh, Everybody got a story to I tell. Mean, yeah, Everybody just, in like, their life has a story to tell. That's just, uh, that's a hard, that's a hard one right there. I want to know how to, I want to know how to feel about that one. I mean, I'm sure I wouldn't want to go through that, but I'm sorry to hear that, man. That's horrible. Yeah, we love it. So that happened, that your dad passed and it was just like. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, second day, I went to the viewing, and I didn't want to go in there. And uh, my boy Pinky brought me in there. He's a lifelong family friend, dude. Uh, he was a kid that always hung around my dad. And he took me in there, and then we left. And, uh, you know, I ended up uh, getting some. And get it, I got introduced to methamphetamines. 
and uh, some amazing. So crazy. Y- your dad passing, him being so close to you, was that the reason you got you start going to a next level of no addiction or I, drugs? I, I, I don't think so. I could never put that on anybody. You mm. know, it was it was. I would always say it was my choice. Right. But um, it was definitely the the first hit. Whenever I did it, um, I smoked it, and I, it was a different way of smoking it, bro. It wasn't like like a crack tube or anything. It's like they would legit take a rubber hose, put it on a glass tube, and heat the glass tube until it was hot, and let it cool, and then you would sniff the line, and it would turn into smoke and everything, and it was yeah. it was insane. But it it took all my feelings. I felt nothing. I felt numb completely. Like, to the touch and your whole body. So was just deep. trying to get away, just trying to not think of things. Well, I didn't. I, I didn't know what I wanted. <laughs> All I knew was that dude said he had a had an option for me. I took it. I didn't know I was going to run with it for fourteen years. Mm. Say that again. I didn't know I was going to run with it for fourteen years. Wow. You know, and this wasn't like ice. This was homemade. Homemade shit, and. It did a lot of damage real quick. And then I left Bounce City. I went to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and became a bouncer at a So uh, <clears throat> why did you leave Mountain City? Did you, I left you Mountain fought? City because I kept failing drug tests on my probation. And I had six years over my head. And I did my five years, and I was about to complete probation. But I ain't paid nothing. I hadn't done everything that they said. So he reinstated me with a new judge, Judge Street. Shout out to Judge Street. And he, Shout out to he, street. <laughs> and he gave me, Salute. he said, uh, if I ever see you again in front of me, you'll do your six years day for day and reinstated me another six years. So, so you I, just took off from Mount City? Yes, sir. And I left. For how, how'd, you, you, how'd you leave Mount City? Did you? I hitchhiked. What? I hitchhiked all the way down to Western Salem. <laughs> and with David, David helped big too. David's a big part of that. But, um, so now you, 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 you're down there. Yeah, now I'm in Winston-Salem. <laughs> I'm, in, uh, I'm, I'm from Mount City, <laughs> and I'm in a city, you know. It's a, little, it's a culture shock, 100%, and I'm down there with my mother. And uh, I ended up getting a job uh, working at a gentleman's club called Lust, and I was uh, the bathroom attendant in there. And that was fun. It was great. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> it was so much fun, bro. But uh, after that, I ended up leaving going to Texas. I went to Texas and uh, that's whenever me and my, my uh, wife at the time, uh, which I don't much talk about her because. So I know you, you, you talked about that first time when you cut your, your son's hair, being the first haircut. <clears throat> so we're trying to tie all this in. That's why I'm asking these questions. So from that time to you going to Winston-Salem, <clears throat> were there any gaps where you was cutting hair in between or ever thinking about? I just some. Um, I did some hair cutting, but it's usually just on my cousin. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't really mess with too many people. And if I did, um, our backgrounds were different. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to braid. I didn't know how to twist. I didn't know how to do that. I did some tattooing, but that was, so that was just, to that extent. So you just cutting people's hair who would yeah. just need a cut. Yeah. Somebody hit you up, hey, yeah. man, I remember I cut my son's this, I think I could do this. Well, I mean, it's, it wasn't that. It was, uh, it was it was something that somebody needed. I was always that type of person to cater to somebody. Okay. And the thing is, you didn't even know at that time you wanted to become a barber. No. My my entire purpose in life after my dad passed away and me leaving Mount City was finding a place to call home. Mm-hmm. And I did that. For nine and a half years, I traveled uh, from Texas uh, to um, Klamath Falls, Oregon, where I worked Damn. on horse farms and... I worked in um, scrap yards to buy my own trailer to moving um, back to Florida, down to Fort Myers and doing seawall installing, shrimping and plant shutdowns. Right. Like I couldn't stay off the drugs. Everywhere I went, every place that I applied to, you meet a guy and he's got it. And I, I would just leave that job because I couldn't say no. It would, mm. you, they, they'd always get you, it, it always came to me at my weakest moments. I'm so tired. I gotta be up in four hours to go back to work. Mm-hmm. Or I'm so tired, I go, I still gotta drive to this job and pull an all-nighter fucking flipping shrimp all night. You know, it's just, I, I always overextended myself and I always knew that I could 
I had old methamphetamines to keep me going. So, you know? so what I'm hearing from you too, a lot of times people use because of necessity or they use because oh. of addiction, they use because of sometimes just trying to keep themselves up to perform a, at a job. There's a million reasons. There's a million use. reasons to use. And there's one. You just got to find that one to stay clean. Mm. It's, like, it's a good question. There's a million reasons to use your statement, and you just have to find that one to get clean. That's it. That's crazy. And once you find it, you just don't let it go. Me, mine was, I was, uh, I was done. I was done, and I knew that because I was done that my purpose would find its way to me. Because so, I was so, whenever whenever I, I said I was done, I don't mean as like in just done being, doing drugs. I mean, I came back home knowing I had six years over my head. Mm -hmm. You know, I faced, the, I faced the dragon, okay? I did my time. And as I was doing my time, my purpose, my destiny, my fate hit me. I, I'm a barber. Mm. I'm a barber, not for the fact of I can pick, pick up a pair of clippers and cut some hair but because I can sit here and feel this person. The energy between us clicks. The, the, the feeling of the haircut being what you wanted or, this, or the fact of you seeing what you did wrong and can't wait till that shit grows out so you can redo it, you know? So <clears throat> what I'm hearing is you, you, you came home and you did some time. Hmm. And then when you did some time, that's when you developed that love for the barber and that's when you said, mm. I'm, so talk about that. Yeah, well, I was, a, I was a really angry guy. You know, I had a real temper on me. Mm -hmm. You could be kidding with me and say the wrong thing. And I, I don't know if I'd hit you right then, but it would get close, you know? And, uh, but with the barbering, I was having, I was having good conversations, man. So, so where did that love develop? Did it develop in when you? When they said, thank you, I love it. That's what that's when it developed. When they're when they're hitting that mirror and trying to shine it up as much as it'll shine because it's fucking metal. <laughs> and they're trying to look at they're trying to look at her like Yeah. Oh um, So so your last your last stint when you came home, you got incarcerated. That's what I'm mm -hmm. hearing. Yep. How long was you incarcerated for? I was incarcerated for a year. I was looking at the full six. Okay. But you know, so by, that, by a blessing and a half. So that's what you start. You said that um, you was cutting hair in jail, and that's what you're talking about when they looked in the mirror. So yeah. how, 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 did, how did that come about? You, through all that happened, uh, when we started from a baby and coming up saying born into this industry, born into this um, addiction. Um, so now life has slowed down and you want to kind of chill and you're in jail. You're yeah, in lock. Yeah. You're, you're in lock. Well, it was before I went into jail. Okay. You know, I mean, I was bedridden because of the motorcycle accident I had, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm going through nine months of a boot on my foot because I had two plates and mad screws put in. So I'm learning how to rewalk again, how to bend my toes. I'm, I have no mm -hmm. feeling in certain parts of my foot. Right. So it set me down. Okay. It and let me look at my life. To reflect. To reflect. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I got clean. I wouldn't have got clean if it wasn't for my motorcycle accident. I wouldn't have got clean if it wasn't for the, the, the medicine whenever I tried to kill myself. And I went to the mental health hospital and I finally opened up my feelings to this doctor. And he said, this is the medicine that you were taking before. This is the medicine you need to continue taking because your lithium level is so low. You do not produce it due you know, to past trauma. I could just probably, I, I can't imagine. I've never been addicted or in a situation like that, but I could, I sympathize with people because nobody wants to be hooked on something. I mean, okay. nobody wants to be in a position where they, and not know where to get help, how to get help, or how to even get out of that hole is tough. Man, I t I'm tell you what. What do you see? It's, it's, it's the burning. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, you, ever, you ever have something uh, fragile in your hand and you almost drop it and you get that warm feeling that just went through your body and you're like, oh. I fucked up. Like you, well, when you about to drop it, or you almost dropped you it, you almost yeah. dropped it, and you got yeah. it. That's that feeling you get whenever you you want to get high, all the time until you <clears> get <throat> that fixed. Dang, that's crazy. 
So where did, where did this love form? Was it in jail or before you went to jail? Or how did this, or was it something that you always thought about? And I'm talking about the, the love for cutting it. Something that you always thought about simultaneously every now and then. I thought about it. I thought about <laughs> it uh, a while ago whenever I was doing my dog training. Uh, but at that point, it was dog grooming. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I thought about doing dog grooming. Uh, but that had, I just love training dogs, so I didn't give a shit about the grooming, you know? Right. So. <laughs> man, it's, man, you done a lot of work. He's done right? Yeah, he's, 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 done, he's done a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, rocks. see, that's, that's the whole thing. Like, I used to try to run everywhere I could. I, I was in North Dakota for, God dang, eight months. Yeah, I was a local 5112 in, in the iron working, you know, building the hospital. But guess what happened? I got high. And then I got hired, and then dude was like, family was kingpin of this shit. So it was always there. And then I'd go up there and I'd look 76 feet up, and I'd say, I can't do this. Well, I'm scared of this, yeah. you know? Like four inch beams, six inch beams, that's all you're walking on. Bolts and holes, that's all they're getting on that shit. Fuck like that, dude. I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. But the whole, the whole matter of uh, the barbering, to addiction is, is you just don't know where your passion is going to come from. Mm -hmm. My passion came from um, always pushing people away. Mm -hmm. My passion came from not wanting to hear people speak, not putting in the effort to other people unless it was a woman, because I was trying to get something from them, you know? So today in my recovery, I know I enjoy listening to people's happiness, struggles, and hard times, because struggles and hard times are completely different. Hard times are your past, struggles are what you go through now. And to be able to have some knowledge in recovery, and then even being able to have some knowledge in talking to just people, because people in recovery are people. They just have a different way of life, you know? And I've been hearing about this glorif glorifying uh, recovering addicts. You know, it's... Uh, if, if for me with my little sister Ashley Stewart, uh, the day she the day she overdosed, mm, she um, pops his, his sister. Go ahead. Yeah, when she <laughs> overdosed, she was only twenty eight years old. She was the same age as my best friend Tyler, Tyler Hoy, and she did it four years later. Same shit. It was at fentanyl. And I came back from Alaska, and in my gut, I was like, I need to go see my sister, man. So I made my mom take me over there. And I was like, you know what? It was sketchy, bro. Like, dude come out with wraps around his legs, all kinds of shit. It took him like 30 minutes to come outside. And then I was like, what the hell is going on? He got my little, my little four-year-old niece in there. So I was, like, my, I was like, sis, can I stay at night with you? Yeah, I'm talking about, bro. My niece would stay up all night, sleep all day. There was needles thrown in the walls. I wasn't, I wasn't an IV user, all right? But blood squirts all over the walls. That next morning, I'm not gonna lie, I was high as gas. But whenever I, I pulled the sheet back to my little niece to give her her, her tablet, she said she was hot, so I pulled it off. Just the trailer had no electricity. Had a generator running outside. Pulled it back and there was a needle open, draw back with blood about that far from her fucking foot. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That was it. I lost it. I lost it. And then I left. I hitchhiked a uh, hundred and some miles back home. Mom got home, made her go get my niece. My niece showed up, gave her a bath, chilled with her. I laid on the floor with her until she went to bed and hold her little hand. And because she already, Uncle Shane, he lay with me, you know. Yes. And uh, we got a call. Mom got a text message. And she, all I heard was screaming, crying. And then she locked herself in the fucking room. So I had to fucking put, put my hand through the door and open the door. And as soon as I sent the text message, the next thing you know, the police officer showed up. And my little sister, that last little argument that we had about 
she needed to get her shit together whenever her brother was just as much a piece of shit as she was. You know, sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I feel I don't know if I pushed her to end her own shit or if uh, it was just accidental or or what. But I can never get that clarity, you know, and that that made me go hardcore. I walked the streets drunk and high, starting shit with anybody that ever wanted it. So that was <clears throat> that was right before you decided to come back home or how? That was a year, one year to the almost to the date. I got clean December 1st, 2021. I lost my sister a year before that. Okay. September 4th. So he was just like, man, I'm tired of running. I just gotta. My dad passed October 4th. So every month we've got something. It's crazy. So every, if, I, I'm not saying everything is a trigger. Right. But if I could sit here and say that I still don't think about sometimes going out there and getting drunk, it's it's a body thing. But I know that if I take a drink, then I can't stop because this is who I am. I drink until it's gone and then I want more, and then I'm on drugs. Right, so now, <clears throat> fast forward, all these traumatic things that happened to your life, how did that help you form your passion? Oh man, whenever I came into recovery resource and I, I told, uh, I was in a box truck with uh, Craig Forrester, and I was telling him that uh, I was getting into barber school. And he's like, what do we need to get that done? I said, don't even worry about it. I've already, I've already made the proper steps. For that person that, to even act like that right. towards me to do something just made me believe in myself a little bit more. For sure. You know? And then everybody at the house, every day, every day I was cutting one to two heads. Mm. Every day, I would cut it longer with it too. So you, so you was in jail, and you got out of jail. You went to recovery rehouse. Recovery resources. Recovery, yeah. recovery resources. So in jail, you started forming your passion. Yes. And you started slowly thinking about this. So talk about that. All right. So with the, I was a trustee there. So at certain points, you have a lot of time on your hands. Mm -hmm. And the Clippers came in brand new because we were questioning. I was like, cool, man. He's like, hey, man, you cut my hair. I was like, yeah. He's like, can you cut hair? I said, we could, we could see what I could do. I was like, what do you want? He's like, I want a, I want a bald faith. I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I did my best, man. You know, but uh, it looked more like a bowl. Got a chili bowl. I, I had everything down here mm -hmm. and up. It well, was funny. Uh, at least you was confident in yourself enough yeah. to even try it. Yeah, hey, a lot it of people are like, nah, I ain't even yeah. gonna try it like that. Well, see, we it. could we couldn't sit on we couldn't the chairs that we sat on were had a mesh on them. Right. So we couldn't sit on that. So I had to stack milk crates for him. <laughs> oh. So he said he's sitting on milk crates, right? And I'm sitting there cutting two and a half hours go by, right? <laughs> he comes out, he's like, Okay. So it looks pretty good. I was like, Yeah, yeah. all right, good. And then uh we would start doing that like every three days. What? Because it was just him and I that clicked together. And then the guard, I was banging with a beard. Like I used to have a beard down to here, bro. And every time I went to a, a, a Hispanic barbershop in Florida, they would always cut it to a V for some reason and like do this thing. And I was like, I can't do that shit. Cause they took every, all my girth away. So I started doing YouTube videos on how to cut a beard. Right. I've been cutting my beard for six years right you know like I, I got the style down i got the how to brush and how to you know do, what to do. You do got. the whole thing so that's where i love i love doing my beard so right that so, was my so would you say you're a biz a beard specialist beardologist yeah okay <laughs> right. I, everybody everybody, ha everybody has their niche <laughs> like right. you know something that they really like more than other things yeah. i mean it, yeah that beard that, that beard men because people really don't like yesterday i cut old boy's hair uh, i cut tyler's hair and, uh, you know, he's like, man, like he, he was going to supposed to be there at 10 mm -hmm. and with like three of his boys. And he didn't show up till six. That night? Yeah. With three of his boys? No, just him. Just him. But I was, you know, I was like, all right, bro, I'll still, I got I'll still you. cut your hair, right? And he's like, well, just do what you think. So I hooked him up and he looked, went to the mirror and looked. He's like, you know what, bro? He says, I ain't never said this. He said, but I like this. Okay, good. He said, I don't, I said, that's why I don't go to. I mean, that's the, that's the best feeling when someone, yeah. when someone tells you that, man, this looks good. Even though when, you, when you're when not even trained to do it and someone says, hey, 
That looks good. Yeah. You know, and that gives you a vote of confidence. It's, it, 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 here's the thing, too. It's like if you know somebody, you know, a little bit, then you can get to know them right. and you get to know their haircut. Like, I've only known you for a little bit. But you, you know um, um, Sinbad? Comedian? Sinbad, yeah. yeah. You know, From what? The comedian. The comedian. Sinbad. You know he's got that. Yeah. I tell her. That's I think, how I, I, think, I, think I know who it is. Yeah, yeah. You say he look like Sinbad? Yeah. Well, I mean, he's got that feature a little bit. That's yeah. how I would do yeah. how I would do his hair a little yeah. bit, you yeah. know? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's seen who he said he's comedian. Yeah, yeah. He was also he's in old uh, school guy. He, he did he's a been... movie with the little kid Shazam. No, that was Shaq. Yeah, yeah. Sinbad. You'll Google him. So yeah, look him up. Is, did he play in Kid and Play? I, I think so. Yep. Yeah. He played his kid, right? Um, or, he, or is it play? I didn't see. I can't remember. But he's the one with the flat top, right? Yeah, yeah. In the kid and play. I'm pre- I, yeah. I think I know you're yeah, talking you about. Well, no, yeah, that's, yeah. that's 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 kid and play. Though. Both those guys, the rappers, yeah, they're no, in. No. The, they're acting themselves. Okay. They're the same dude yeah. plays in Booty Call. Um, I know he's in a couple of movies, but I'm not too mm. sure right now. I wasn't a fan. I think of I know. That. I think I yeah. know. But I'm I'm, I'm young, bro. Don't look like that. It's the earring that does it for you too. You know what I'm saying? But uh, other than that, but so you you forming this passion in jail. Your dad passed, it, and then your sister passed, and then a yeah. year later you like you go into jail, and then you like trying to you trying to slow it down, and the passion is coming. What's the passion is formulating? The passion is there, and, and it, it, the only reason why it's there is because, man, like in addiction, you deprive so many people of your true potential of being there for them. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't fully be there for anybody because you're not even there for your fucking self. So. Like, especially like whenever it comes to family, and then you lose those family members, you're like, man, I could have been. If only they could be with me right now. They, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, but I got my mom, and she said, man, she's so proud of me, bro. And my little sister, I have another little sister named Holly Jean, and she's proud of me. And my little nieces all run to the phone. So I met your little niece at the Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's thing. a little roar. Okay, yeah, and yeah. then you got Leah, <laughs> and then you got little Kinsley, and they all just. <clears throat> so now. Your time is get ready, to, get ready to be released. And so, have you? So, have you thought about things like I'm gonna go to school? Oh, I man, I got it. I got a journal. Uh-huh. Okay, I wasn't getting released till um, I got released June 21st. I was writing in my journal since like February, February 8th. Mm-hmm. I said I will go to barber school every day. Every day I wrote in that journal and said the exact same thing. I would write how I felt and write what I was going through, and I said, "P.S. You will be a barber." So what and that, I still have that. So how, how did that? How did that? How did that formulate? Though? I'm still trying to get to like, how did you know that that's what you wanted to do? Because it was I was there for somebody, and they appreciated. It. I didn't. I didn't have that shit in my past life, bro. My past life was just, you know, let Shane do his own thing because he's an aggressive prick, and he's a fucking addict. And so when I, you said you were you were there for someone that. that the feeling that you had when you cut someone hair and the conversation that you had with them, the bond. Oh, man, the laughter. Th- that's the, what... The music to the laughter, the mm-hmm. the conversations of past stuff. Like, you can talk to anybody about anything as long as you present yourself to them in the correct way. And you find that real easy when that you're door, tired, that, during, when during that time when, they, when you just give them the haircut. Yep. They just open that window and you just put the pie so on the anybody, windowsill and they just come to you. So did anybody tell you, like, man, you're just talking, man. You're just talking. When you said that, so, no, because most of the people, I think, whenever you get to know me a little bit, that you could get to know me in just a minute and know that mm-hmm. he's, he's either sounds like a, a straight shooter. But whenever you got people that know me, know me, mm-hmm. there's we we just we poke at each other all day. Because I know now you talked about, and I'm trying to pit, piece these things together because someone out there they they're trying to follow the story, and you talked about being in jail, and then you also talked about sitting in the box car with Craig. Oh yeah. Man. And so so at, at what so you you got released. So you went to the recovery house. Yeah. And you the whole time you was like this is what I'm going to yeah, do. Yeah, let's let's put it this way. I've been in the re- I've been in a recovery house since June 21st of 2023. Mm-hmm. All right. So that means I've been there about 9 months. And you can finish the program in about 11 months. I'm not going nowhere. I'm staying until they say, Shane, you got to go. Right. Because it's not the fact that I'm not ready, but it's the fact that I'm 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 not ready, bro. You know? Like if you feel on the inside you just want to get out of something, I in my opinion are not ready. You know? 
Like I'm, I, I want the, the the full steps. I want to be able to go to school, and I want to be able to graduate, mm-hmm. and then I want to be able to hit that other part of your school, right? You know, and then whenever I'm done, I want to be able, to, you guys, be able to see me go to a barber shop mm-hmm. and be like, yo, you know how, you know what this went through to right. do this. Like, I'm whenever I met him to who he is today, you know, and well, uh, the stability of of a recovery house is the people in it. It's the, it's the, uh, what's the word? Unity. It's the unity you have in the house. Well, your story is going to help some people, not just who wants, who, someone who's going for a career. Because I feel sometimes there are a lot of people who just don't know where to turn, oh, what to that, do, how to make it happen. Because you think your situation is so dire and there's someone else out there who has something equal or even worse than you. Absolutely. And there, there are options for you. There yeah. are ways... Because the bottom line is people want help. People want some direction. Yeah, and then people also want knowledge to know how to help. Because it's like, what, two out of three, every household is an addict. Right. Whether it's you or somebody you know. Mm -hmm. Like, that's pretty big statistics, Mm -hmm. you know? So so what are some options out there for people, Shane? Which ones? The people that are or people, are. people who are who are addicts, people who are going through stuff and feel that they can't. I would say for the people that are, that are addicts, it's probably a great idea if you would talk to your family and have a sit down and just see if uh, going into treatment is uh, something that you truly need. And if it's something that you need or want, then I would do that because if you want to fucking, if you want to get into a career, you're not going to be able to get into the career if you're still struggling with addiction. Whenever I got out, first day I went to Craig's school. And then from that moment on, I waited three months. Three months, that's a long time to wait to hear anything back. So if you're in active addiction, you can lose everything that you want to do in three months. So we're talking about three months, um, just to be clear, is that I'm... For me, it what, was for what, me. What, what you applied for, and it's an option for people out there who go through situation, is um, something every state has. It's called vocational rehab. Yes. It's at the career services office. Yep. And if you're looking for a career, try to get into something. That's one of the greatest resources out there. Every state has down at the food stamp office. Yep. And what they, what they will do typically, they'll take you through an evaluation and help you help with school, help with housing, and <clears throat> I mean, cover school tuition fully. They even give you a stipend towards the end of the month. So it's important to understand what resources you have out there to help you because I know that's one resource for sure. And also, there's the United Way. Most, most cities, most um, counties and towns, <clears throat> they have options as well. There's things like families free. So talk about some of those options that people can go out there and look for or search or ask someone to help them find. I mean... Even with Depending, the recovery houses. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on if uh, what part of the state you're in, in Tennessee. It it depends on where you're in the in the country, but I've I've never been the recovery resources. The only thing that I could ever say anything about. So we'll talk about that. Re- so man, what is that? Right, so I wouldn't be a I wouldn't be a in my opinion a good conversationist. I wouldn't be. Able, and I know that whenever I'm, it's all said and done, and I get out of this house, I know that whenever I have somebody come in my chair, no matter who it is, no matter how big they are, how small they are, how old they are, I know I'm gonna be able to talk to these people. And due to the fact that every day, I I I have to talk to somebody in recovery. Like you don't know half these people that you know, but you share something about your day in these meetings. You. Uh, speak about something that you're truly passionate about in these meetings. You share about your bad days. You share about the things that you miss. You share about the things you don't want to do. And there's always somebody there for you. Always. And, so and, and again, that helps. The bottom line is people just want help. Yeah. And people just want help. Yeah. And they want resources to help. Yes. So, I mean. And the cool, and the, uh, the events. Yes. Like we invited you to one of the events. Mm-hmm. You know, that was, that was cool. We just did a polar plunge uh, not too long ago where we raised money for recovery resource. And then we all went and jumped into the river when it was snowing and it was freaking awesome because it was just a different worldly thing. And, and a number two that you can call if you go into any type of situation to help with mental health issues, um, addiction, suicide prevention, any type of any type of ailment, anxiety related things that you're going through mentally, 
you can just dial 988. That number is a synonymous no. number across the country that if you dial that number, someone will pick up and someone can help you with some resources and help you find a way to better yourself. That's, 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 a, good, uh, that's a good idea. I mean, either that or, I don't know, am I allowed to put my email I mean, on Yeah, it? it's up to you, but it's because, I mean, this is a, well, I mean, we're, we're in over 70 countries right now around yeah. the world. Top 25 podcast in the United States, top 25 podcast in the world. So <clears throat> your story that we're sharing right now, someone will listen. Someone will hear something that someone will probably try to reach out to you and say, hey, because we are who we are because of others. And sometimes you need someone who've been through something to kind of talk to you and explain to you what they've been through, how they, how they recovered and how they're better. Does that make sense, Jordan? Yeah, I do make sense. Yeah, and, and hearing all of this, what, what goes through your mind? What are you thinking about? Um, I'm thinking that there's, no matter what you go through, there's always some, somebody or something out there that can help you. Uh, it's, just, it's just willing, it's just, are you willing to actually take that step and do it for yourself? And uh, obviously it's, it's all, it's all based off of you, man. If, uh, there's a lot of people that could try to help you, but if you don't want that change for yourself, then it's not gonna happen. And, 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 and it's, it's a process. It's a process. It is it's a, a process. And I know some people sometimes their pride gets in their way, um, but reach out, reach out. And if you have a family member or you have a friend or someone who's going through something, don't turn your back on them. Don't turn your back, because that's, that's one of the worst things that can happen. I mean, true, but sometimes, like, man, I tell you, in addiction, people get tired of it. And if they're not addicts, they don't, they don't care. They're, they're sick of it. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I could, I can imagine. I yeah, mean, you see like, people just beating their head against the wall constantly yeah. and not trying to change. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you really want to get yourself. I mean, that's yeah. very true. You yeah. know, and like I, I would always say that, but care enough always, to reach always, out, yeah. care enough to kind of pass just, on just some resources. Be careful of the last thing you ever say to them, because mm -hmm. the last thing you say to them, because it could anybody. be the last thing you ever say to them. You know, they are addicts. You never know. Be careful you of know? the last thing you say to anyone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I've heard that the best way to talk to somebody is right after they do a good binge. They go on a long run or they had a, had a long drunkard, you know, um, talk to them after that. They'll still be trying to get back into their state of mind and don't, don't get them when they're in the midst of their addiction because they'll run and the opportunity's gone. So you're in barber school right now and... How, how do you, what, how do you feel? What, what, what sense of, what do you feel while you're in school? What, what do you feel looking forward to this, getting your license? What do you feel looking forward to being in the shop? What do you feel looking forward to having this wonderful career that you're pursuing? Well, um, I feel, I feel optimistic about it only due to the fact of my main, my main clientele or my main uh reach out is recovery mm -hmm. you know men and women because coming out of addiction man you, it's it's a it's a minute before you get a job it's a minute for you can have before you get money or if, if you're even trusted with money right. or if you're even allowed to leave the house for a certain period of time you know <laughs> so for women <laughs> this one girl told me that she cut her hair the other night with kitchen scissors. Right. And she says, it looks like a hot mess. I said, I didn't told you, you can come and see me. And you typically, um, if you're going through something there and you're looking to get a clean up, um, you can stop by any local barber schools in your city or state, and they probably have some type of promotion where typically get a haircut for five to eight bucks. You know what I mean? I know sometimes you want to get cleaned up. You want to change the narrative about yourself to get a job, to get a job interview. Yeah. Or you want to just feel good about yourself. Sometimes just go yeah. get a haircut. Just go get your nails done. Uh, go go somewhere. One of those schools. It can it can directly affect and change how you think yeah. and how the outlook of yourself just by getting a haircut. Yeah. And that's for man or woman. You know what I mean? That's I mean that's exactly <coughs> right. Man or woman. Period. You know it's a. Uh, I'm just here to make make them feel good, make them look good, and 
try to give them that little bit of confidence back. Yeah, you know? and, and the bottom line is people want help. People want help and people, people just don't know. Help. Yeah, they just don't know they where. Don't want it. <clears throat> yeah. they, they, they don't know where to go. No. So stopping at the local career services office in your, in your, in your city, your town, yeah. and basically that's the food stamp office, and ask them for referrals. Ask them for help. Yeah. Whether it be um, shelter, um, housing, um, a career where they can help you pay for the career. Um, there's so many government options out there for you. Yeah. And look, I'm not saying that I would be able to answer every message, but I will do my best if you have. Um, you can look me up on Instagram. That's uh, so Barber, which is S-O-B-A-R-B-E-R-13. And then you can also find me uh, on my Facebook, which is Shane Tolles, T-O-W-L-E-S. And if you need help with just somebody to talk to, if you need just some resources for here in East Tennessee, because I know in addiction, a lot of people travel, a lot mm-hmm. of people run. If you're sick of running and you want a career and you want friends, family, this is this is the best place that I could ever say would be good for that. Not just the fact because I'm going to be here, but there's other people here that are like me. You know, it's just you can't judge a book by their cover. You know? And just being around other positive people helps. Yeah, very. Yeah. Everybody has their bad days, but I don't walk around with a black cloud you know, strapped to a dog collar and a leash no more, you know? I'm yeah. just, uh, I just give everybody as much love as I can and I keep the negative people away from me, you know? That's important. So what do you think about today, Joe, and the podcast today? What'd you hear? Very uh, positive podcast today. Um, obviously, that's a, it's a topic that's really needs to be talked about a lot more. There's a lot, I'm sure obviously, there's a lot more people out here that are probably going through a lot of struggles and need somebody to talk to, but, um, yeah, you just gotta, you gotta reach out and don't be scared to talk to somebody if you ever have anything to be talking about, you know, cause it's never good to keep everything in. Uh, yeah, I mean, friends and family, I'm sure they always want something like, you know, want to do good, but it's all based off of you as well. Can't, can't blame everybody for everything that you're going to. And, and that's a sector of the population that people almost want to try to kind of turn their back on, you know, people with addiction, people with um, substance abuse, um, the jail population, um, the recidivism rate is really going up. But I mean, these are people who are going to be your neighbors and people who are going to be in your community. These are people who are getting out of jail eventually. So, how can, the, the the question is, how can we help them? Because if you don't help them, they're going to go back to doing the same thing oh. all over and over again. But if we give a glimmer of hope it's- to those to kind of point them in a the direction for a career, that might help. It, it can help. I'm the if I can I say yeah. something about that because before I got out of jail, I didn't. I did not want to come to a sober house. I didn't make that decision going to a sober house until I made parole, and I was like, "Yeah, I can fucking have a drink." And that was whenever I realized that I have more of a problem than I'll ever be able to control of my own. So I made sure that when I got out, it was straight into a sober living house. Some people are different, but I'm telling you what, if you're coming out of jail, get into a sober living house if you have issues with drugs and alcohol. Because other than that, you might either be right back in there for a longer period, or we might not be able to see you ever again. So what's the difference between a um, halfway house and a sober living house? We're pretty much both the same, but halfway houses are like Oxford houses. Oxford houses have a little more a leniency to have, uh, they don't have as many strict rules. With us in recovery living, you have five meetings a day. You got three in-house meetings, and then you have, uh, you got to get your two outside meetings. So those things just help you hold yourself accountable. I say, very, it's about something based off of yourself, if you know, if it's like a really, if you're really bad at Yeah. Like it might yep. be a really bad addiction compared to somebody that might not be <laughs> as bad and they could control it a little bit better, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, the successful rate for recovery resources, uh, it's mind-blowing due to the fact that I've been there. Right. I've seen people come in and be there for two weeks and gone. I've seen people be there for three months and you couldn't even tell. You couldn't even tell mm. until they got too far and then they started slacking well, on Well, them. the key thing is now um, Crown Cuts Academy, uh, we're teaming up with Ballard Health and also um, 
<clears throat> um, another medical oh, yeah. profession, Dr. Cham, and his um, New Life Medicine here in Johnson City, Tennessee, um, to kind of help with that. So with our partnership, yeah. we hope to kind of give people the resources, the basic um, health care that they're going to need, uh, and just kind of come up with a game plan for them while they're in jail. So by the time they get out of jail, we'll have careers forming aesthetics, cosmetology, barbering, and nails. And the school's great, man. <laughs> Like the school's laid back. I love Craig's school. Like whenever I first went in there, it's it's open. You don't feel smushed in. The the barber chairs are set up nice. The all the students get along really good. We don't have no problems with any students. Like the instructors are pretty pretty right. good with all their uh, <clears throat> techniques and things. And you got people upstairs. Yeah, well, just the atmosphere that we're trying to create. Uh, yeah. I think we're probably, I don't know how many schools in the country have to have a weight room. Has a game room. Uh, the pool so, table's nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. We have yeah. arcade. Yeah. We have chess. We have oh, checkers. Got a, got a Pike House coffee yeah. right there. And we you got a, a Thai shop, restaurant attached to it. Oh, within like a 30. Yeah, I want. He just, the, yeah, coffee place. Coffee building, place so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just trying to make, again, this, uh, my, my focus is trying to make it into more so of like a college campus. Mm. And oh, then there's apartments you can live in there. Yeah, so it's there, like you could rent apartments that are there. It's, it's almost like seven thousand square feet. And yeah, I like the fact that a lot of students come in the morning early, get get a lift in. And the bus runs on both sides. Right, so. so you got red route <laughs> and purple route. But again, um, again, the bottom line is we're just trying to give a glimmer of hope, and people just want a chance. Yeah. And if you in the area reaching out to try to get a career, um, check out your local barber, cosmetology, aesthetic school or nails, it's, it's a great career that when someone can, you can go into um, where you can work for yourself, make some really good money, um, and take care of your family. Because ultimately, bottom line is people want to take care of themselves. People want to go on vacation. People want to be able to have a car, have a home, and buy some clothes, take some, buy some shoes, buy something that they like to take care of themselves. And what we offer in this, in this area is opportunity to give yourself an upper hand. Sacrifice. Not a hand up, but an upper hand for yourself. So you got to sacrifice. Yep, yep. So um, every good thing got to come to an end. And this was a powerful podcast. I hope it can do some good and it can help one person. If you can help one person lift themselves and change their career and do something and get some options as far as like um, services and, and give you some direction, I hope this did it for you. And again, last the word, Shane. I don't think I did enough. What about you, Jordan? You know, mine. Mine's always uh, live life, have fun, go be great. Uh, don't be scared to fail. So just keep, just keep, keep on getting, bro. Keep on getting and getting. Yes, sir. And again, Barber College Success brought to you by Craig Charles of Crown Cuss Academy, JC. Crown Cuss Academy, Bristol and Proficient Male Academy, downtown JC. We also add the aesthetics program at Crown Cuss in Johnson City. So looking forward to you. We do. Um, Enrollment the first Tuesday of every month. Hit us up. We have some great payment options. We can get you in, get you square, and get you there. Peace.